found some weird problems in Counter-Strike 2, namely, the 13900K has a surprisingly bad frame time consistency as compared to lower spec parts, like the 13700K and the 13600K. It's not terrible, but it's a unique problem, and we were able to diagnose it in the course of testing today, so we have not only the problem, but an explanation of what's causing it. Uh, there's also some interesting data for the X3D cache-heavy CPUs. So owners of the 5800X3D especially will probably be pretty happy with the overall performance that we're seeing. But because of the game launching in effectively a playtesting beta state, uh, you may not have had the cleanest experience at launch. It does appear though that Valve is working on it. So today we're doing CPU benchmarks. This will accompany our GPU benchmarks for Counter-Strike 2. And then we're kind of done with testing the games for a little bit, and we're switching over fully to some hardware reviews because we're going to let Counter-Strike 2, we're going to let it bake a little longer with the updates before we revisit this one. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and the CryoSheet Graphene Pads. These CryoSheets are molecularly stacked in the Z-axis to encourage vertical direct thermal transfer from the IHS to the cooler. CryoSheet pads are made to be easily applicable for a thermal interface and completely avoid paste dryout because it's not paste. It makes them particularly useful for lawn service life systems with minimal maintenance. They come in multiple sizes for suitability on the most common laptops and desktop CPUs, and you can learn more at the Thermal Grizzly Cryo Sheets at the link in the description below. So Counter-Strike's been updating constantly since launch. It's been almost every day, and we actually talked about this in our recent Hardware News episode where we ran some new benchmarks with some of the improvements, and it's true. There are some fixes for frame time consistency. Now, it still has a lot of problems, but at least it's moving in the right direction, and uh, it's a good thing that Valve is pushing patches as fast as they are, because it's obviously far better to improve the game rapidly rather than preserve it in a buggy state so that we can finish our benchmark testing. Uh, so it's far from perfect still, but we have some numbers where run-to-run -run consistency has somewhat improved on some of the video cards. CPUs are a little different story depending on which CPU you look at, though. For CPU benchmarking, the majority of our data was captured on October 3rd and 4th. Normally the day is irrelevant, but in this case that matters because of the game versioning. Some of the initial data was collected on October 2nd, but the bulk of it was on the 3rd and 4th. And then the game updated nearly each day across that test period. Not all the updates appeared to have detailed patch notes. Uh, we ran validation tests and we saw a little change overall for CPU benchmarking from one game version to the next. So when I say validation tests, what that means is we would take a CPU that was already completed for testing from a prior day, run it again, and look for a change. And typically, it was within about 1%. Uh, so no wild swings introduced that we found. That said, it's possible there could be some, just maybe it would be a, an AMD test scenario or something. Or we saw some with the 4070 uh, because of shader compiling performance and sort of, I, I guess, chunk loading, you might call it, in the maps. But that's a different issue entirely than what we're doing today. That said, we were still forced to run a couple patches for this data set. We'd prefer not to and to stick with one, but that's the state of Valve moving too fast for us to do otherwise. This will be our last set of CS2 benchmarks for now. The next time you see this game pop up, it's going to be either in our CPU review suite or our GPU review suite. But as far as standalones, unless there's some kind of massive change, uh, we're going to be done with testing this one. So with all that, let's get into the benchmarks and towards the last set of them will explain to you what the, what is causing those unique 13900K behaviors. The first thing we noticed was that X3D does really well in our testing. The X3D CPUs demonstrated a noticeably higher frame rate, despite the 13900K showing limited scaling under our 720p results versus 1080p. The 7800X3D's 398 FPS average was matched closest by the 5800X3D, actually, potentially indicating an advantage for the X3D cache. The 7800X3D CPU then leads the 7700X by about 3.8%, and the 5800X3D gapped the 5800X by 5.4%. Now, at this point, the question remains of whether or not we're GPU bound at the very high end, but we can check for that. We'll look at GPU busy, and we'll look at 1080p medium. Before we get there, though, the 13900K has some particularly bad lows here. These were repeatable across multiple passes, specifically at 1080p low settings, but we also did passes with Vulkan at 720p and saw similar. Considering the whole chart for a second though, we'll come back to the 13.9, the game is highly playable on all of these CPUs, even in more intensive areas. We're still at 200 FPS on the R5 2600, and any issues with lows are more related to the game itself right now than a CPU fault, although 
there are things you can do with the CPUs to try and remedy that. In terms of pure latency at a professional or at least a top percentile level, you might notice a difference between 400 FPS and 200 FPS for click to photon, but the average player could play the game on any of these CPUs here today and be more limited by skill than frame rate. The next most concerning item would be frame time consistency, but we covered that mostly in our GPU benchmarks. There are definitely lower performing CPUs, and of course we're at low settings, but we haven't tested anything lower than an R5 2600 for this game. Most of our CPUs appeared to be somewhat bound in the 380s, something we initially thought was a GPU bind, but later disproved. And then X3D broke out, with the exception of the 7950X3D, which is suffering from having too much of a good thing. As for trends, the game definitely gets use out of clock speed increases. We see that in the 2600 to the 3600, where there's about an 18% increase in performance. Likewise, there's some benefit from small core count changes. So the 10600K to the 10700K, which also includes a clock change and a cache change, saw a 10% gain, while the 10900K climbed 10% from the 10700K. This scaling remains fairly linear between Intel SKUs. Overall, scaling is relatively predictable here, but again, as a reminder, the game remains somewhat chaotic in its frame time pacing and just general performance, despite the improvements. This means the benchmarks aren't the same run to run, or at least there's more variance than we typically see in a game, and that causes some difficulty with pure isolated testing. At 1080p medium, we're hitting the same limits as 1080p low. That indicates to us that we're CPU bound as increasing the GPU workload would reduce the top end performance and truncate these results. The fact that they're about the same indicates that the cache advantage on X3D is exactly that, a cache advantage. CS2 seems to like the extra cache, or at least it does for now. The 13900K's lows improved here, but are still significantly lower than other CPUs in the chart. This indicates to us that there may be a specific type of load that's getting placed on the CPU, when dropping the settings or that load is shifting to something else, like maybe the GPU, when increasing them. The same goes for the 7950X3D. Both of these, though, share in common a high thread count, so we'll look into that as well. As for the rest, the rankings are similar. The 12100F and the 3600 trade places, but not by much, so we can skip ahead. Up next, to look at some Vulkan renderer benchmarks. This requires setting a flag in Steam to force Vulkan rendering. The 13900K runs 31% faster with DirectX over Vulkan. The same is true of AMD CPUs where DirectX is faster than Vulkan. And the R5 2600 and DX actually outperformed the R5 3600 when the latter was running Vulkan. Vulkan is still in experimental stages for Counter-Strike 2, and thus far, we're not seeing a reason to favor it. We saw a similar with medium settings, but no point showing the same thing. Now we come back to our problematic entry. As we said, the 13900K was consistently and dramatically reduced in its 0.1% lows as compared to other CPUs. Looking into this, we ran a series of one-off tests to investigate. Here are the results. We first disabled hyper-threading, which did nothing overall. We're at about the same performance, and the differences here are functionally error. Next, we overclocked the CPU and disabled hyper-threading. This also had no movement. And finally, we left hyper-threading enabled, so we undid the last two things, but we toggled the e-cores off. This alone resulted in massively improved frame times and lows. The 0.1% result climbed by 100 FPS here, which is a huge swing, and it significantly changes the experience, even with the lows at 90 or whatever they were before, jumping to 200, that's something you can feel. 90's fine, yes, but from a frame time pacing perspective, remember that 0.1% lows are averages of the worst results. So some of those spikes you would have noticed. This to us suggests that there may be some magic number of cores as a threshold beyond which performance is hurt. But it's apparently not just the threads, otherwise disabling hyperthreading would have been enough. The e-cores don't seem to hinder the lower core count CPUs in quite the same way, or at least not the same magnitude, so it's more unique to the 13900K here. For now, at least, we'd suggest users of the 13900K, unfortunately, toggle e-cores off if you are primarily playing CS2 and this is important to you. If you're playing things beyond that, or you're just not that competitive in CS2, or this doesn't bother you, or you don't notice it, then uh, just leave them on, because they're more globally useful, uh, even if they are not useful here and they're actually a hindrance. But at least we diagnosed it. So wrapping up, although Valve has definitely improved some of the performance, the main things we learned here are, there's a couple of them. The first one is that the Vulkan renderer really is underperforming. So it, maybe there's a situation where it works better than DX11 with a certain set of hardware. But for what we tested it on, 
it does appear that Vulcan, as a renderer in, in Counter-Strike 2 right now, is a lower performer than DirectX. Uh, so we would default to DirectX. And then E-Cores are problematic on the 1300K specifically, at least in our test scenario. And again, the, the qualifier is here because this game is changing so much that it's hard to have the same level of ultra-high confidence as we might have for a more stable game. But uh, E-Cores, we definitely saw a repeat problem on the 1300K, turning them off, fixed the problem, improved the frame times massively, but didn't really affect the average. Um, so for that one, there's not really a workaround other than if this is the main game you're playing, just turn the E-Cores off. And uh, otherwise, we would advise not turning them off because you're cutting part of the CPU that you paid for off at that point. X3D definitely does something here. So 5800 X3D owners, 7800 X3D owners, uh, it appears in our testing that there's a bit of an advantage there. And we also did a quick check of GPU Busy with the 7800 X3D data. So when we ran those numbers, it revealed that we were actually still technically CPU bound on the 7800 X3D. Now it was close. So the actual total frame time was about, it was with maybe two milliseconds or so longer than the GPU busy time, which means there's a little bit of room in there for the GPU to do some more work. In other words, it was behaving as if it's CPU bound or bound by something other than the GPU, uh, but it was still pretty close together. So we're, we're near the sort of uh, max range of what we're going to get out of this benchmark with these parts. And then also we talked in the news video about some of NVIDIA's testing approach because uh, its high-end numbers differed from what we've been able to produce, but we did have an answer on why that is. We'll point you to the news episode if you care about that. So that's it for this one. Overall, it plays pretty well on everything we tested. Uh, at least plays pretty well here being the, the, in the relative sense. One to the next, they, they're like all 200 FPS plus in most of these scenarios. Uh, it's just that frame time consistency that remains uh, a bit of a nuisance for Counter-Strike 2, and that's something that Valve has said it's working on. So that's it for these benchmarks. Thanks for watching. Check back for some hardware reviews coming up. You can subscribe for that or go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly and patreon.com slash gamersnexus to throw us a few bucks if you like these kinds of benchmarks and find them useful. And thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.